Thank you, Sid. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you all today at QCon uh, to share that the world is becoming more transactional. Uh, from servers to serverless and per second billing, uh, you used to buy a server every three years or rent dedicated by the month, then an instance by the hour, and now every second there's a serverless transaction. And in the same way, from coal to clean energy, our energy sources are changing to be more transactional. So you have smart meters around the world that now transact energy every 30 minutes instead of once a month. So it's an increase of 1,440 times. Uh, and then there's the tsunami of instant payments. For example, India's UPI processed 10 billion real-time transactions in 2019. And this year, in the month of August alone, uh, UPI processed 10 billion transactions. Uh, so India went from 10 billion a year to 10 billion a month and will triple over the next three years. If India is leading, then other countries are not far behind. For example, Brazil, 3 billion a month, growing 200% a year. And this is spreading, for example, to the US with the introduction of FedNow. So the world is becoming more transactional. The volume of online transactional processing, or OLTP, across several sectors has grown by three orders of magnitude, and yet, the three most popular OLTP databases today, Postgres, MySQL, and SQLite, are 20 to 30 years old, designed for a different world and a different scale, which I think is a testament uh, to the people that designed these databases, uh, that they still power everything today. And at the same time, um, in, th in the same 30 years, we've seen advances in hardware and research. Uh, so there are hints of the need to redesign OLTP for a new order of magnitude. Starts with a creeping dependence on caching, escalates to deployments that have 64 shards of Postgres or MariaDB, and capitulates to the extreme of replacing the OLTP database entirely. For example, the switch that powers India's UPI runs on open source, but not open source OLTP. Instead, they append transactions to Kafka, then they've rewritten the transactions processing logic in Java services above Redis. So they're doing around 10,000 logical payments per second at peak, and 10 times that many physical database queries. So 100,000 transactions a second in terms of database transactions is the peak OLTP load. Yet even a tenth of this, 1,000 TPS for systems, a fraction of the size of UPI is still not easy to do. So the other problem is that open source OLTP databases are not online if you interpret online in the mission critical sense. So they're single node out of the, out of the box. You get synchronous replication, yes, but there's no consensus algorithm baked in, no raft or Paxos. So failover is manual and you risk data loss. And I think this is why at the, on the other end of the spectrum you see mission critical systems start to abandon open source entirely. Uh, they move to proprietary cloud databases to trust the cloud provider with the problems of scale, availability, and cost efficiency. How can we do better? Uh, can we redesign OLTP by three orders of magnitude? I hope that by the end of our time together, we'll see not only that it's possible, but that it's exciting and needs to be done, especially if we change the way we think about scalability. So I love this paper by Frank McSherry. Uh, because it shows, I think, you know, perhaps we focus too much on the scalability of our systems and we've lost sight of the need to optimize our unit of scale. So it's common in software or distributed systems to define scalability as doing more with more. You handle orders of magnitude more workload with orders of magnitude more machines. Uh, the trouble is that OPEX gets out of hand. Firstly, operating expenditure, so you pay for more machines. And secondly, operating experience. One thing you know, manage a, s a single node server, it's another to manage a thousand. So I prefer the definition of scalability from industrial engineering, do more with less. Um, so you, you handle orders of magnitude more load with the same machine. Uh, so you start to ask the question, how can we take our unit of scale, a single machine, and redesign the design so that we can go from a thousand real world transactions a second to a million transactions a second uh, and thinking in terms of the exponent like this, you know, tweaking that exponent, it's a challenge, a fun challenge, uh, because there are only so many microseconds in a second. You know, to process a million transactions, your budget is one microsecond per transaction. It's not very long. Uh, uh, but to make it no less easy, we're also not going to take shortcuts. Uh, so no magic tricks, no eventual consistency, no, no weak durability here. Uh, we're going to have to work hard together. 
Um, if we want to handle orders of more scale with the same machine and, in fact, better guarantees, uh, because the default isolation level, for example, in Postgres is actually read committed, uh, which is not so safe. Uh, you know, you might query an account balance, see that there's enough to transact, uh, but then query again and see that another database transaction has withdrawn the balance you thought you had. So we need to offer the highest level of isolation and strict serizability. And to do this, I, th I think we need to think from first principles. So to ask the question, how can we optimize our unit of scale? Um, how can we take the four primary colors of computer science, network, storage, memory, compute, and blend them into a more optimal design? This was the question we asked in July 2020 as we began to create Tiger Beetle. Uh, at the time, we were working on an open source pay payment switch. Uh, we wanted a drop-in open source OLTP database to power this switch more cost efficiently. So we wanted to tweak the exponents and nail the scale uh, with a distributed financial transactions database optimized for OLTP. Uh, our goals were to improve performance by three orders uh, using the same or less hardware and for the design to be significantly safer and easier to operate. Uh, so Tiger Beetle's license under Apache 2, my favorite open source license, uh, and we're approaching our first production release. Uh, the dream is to run OLTP at any scale in any environment, and indeed the beetle we named Tiger Beetle after thrives in all kinds of environments. Also, one of the fastest creatures in the world, uh, sprinting at 5.6 miles per hour, 125 body lengths per second. Scaled for size, the Tiger Beetle is the fastest insect and land animal on Earth, and doesn't it look it? Uh, so Tiger Beetle is meant to be fast and small, but what is OLTP? What do we mean by transactions? Database transactions? Or are database transactions named after another kind of transaction? The everyday transactions, every, you know, everyday business in every sector, the who, what, when, where, why, and how much um, of business. So I find it fascinating that the first popular OLTP benchmark was literally called debit credit. And this wasn't just any benchmark either. So I love the, the Anon et al, anonymous. But in fact, there were 24 et al's, 24 co-authors collaborating with Jim Gray, the transactions processing guru, uh, who was a tandem at the time, also coined the term ACID, also gave us the five minute rule. Uh, Jim's debit credit benchmark inspired so many benchmark wars uh, that soon the Transaction Processing Performance Council formed to standardize LTP benchmarks. And then, again, you know, the history, historical context of transactions was all financial, banking, banking, warehouse, brokerage. Uh, and once upon a time, OLTP actually included analytics in there somewhere. Um, you didn't have the term OLAP, um, and general purpose is also somewhere in between. So until 1993, uh, Edgar Codd coined the term OLAP as online analytical processing, and OLAP spun out of OLTP. So where OLTP is interested in the who, what, when, where, why, and how much, OLAP is more interested in the why and what if. Uh, so where OLTP is write heavy with a high volume of simple queries, OLAP is read heavy with less volume and complex queries. So OLTP is actually not really a query execution engine. You know, that's all the OLAP stuff. OLTP is just how do we get stuff in the front door? And OLAP is like, okay, now how do we query? Uh, so after OLAP spun out of OLTP, object storage quickly followed suit, and we no longer store blobs in our OLTP database, we use the database as a queue. Uh, so that today we use OLTP for business transactions um, and, and anything general purpose, uh, which means that the OLTP database is forced to generalize and there's no separation of concern. So I think you see where I'm going with this. You know? Just as DuckDB is better at OLAP than SQLite, this frees SQLite to focus on general purpose workloads. I think we can unlock scale if we separate our general purpose processing from OLTP. So if we take all the metadata relating to business transactions, we move it out of the data plane into the control plane for OLGP to continue to carry the mixed read-write control plane workloads that have less volume than a data plane, which remains OLTP. So if we apply separation of concerns to the OLGP control plane and OLTP data plane like this, then I think we can start to reach three orders in three design decisions across storage engine, consensus, and network. Um, here, with respect to the network, we find that scale increases aerodynamic drag. As you go through three orders of magnitude, the pressure on everything increases. 
uh, anything that's not isomorphic burns up. So you suddenly see an impedance mismatch where there wasn't one before. And that's because while the language of database transactions is SQL, the language of business transactions in the real world is double entry accounting. So I, I would never want to replace SQL for analytics. It's great, you know, send one query in, get a lot of analysis out. Um, but there's also a lot going for double entry. You know, if your workload is OLTP and you want to track business transactions, you know, the Jim Gray debit credit, then double entry is really the perfect schema, which means you see this tension in query amplification. So here, here it is, a switch wants to execute the debit credit logic for one financial transaction, but this needs on the order of 10 read-write database queries. So you can use stored procedures to get this amplification down to one, but then a million transactions a second is still a million network requests a second, you know, more with more. So it's not more with less. So what if we could invert query amplification to our advantage? What if in one database transaction we could process 10 business transactions, 1,000 business transactions, even 10,000? You know, this would give not three orders, but four orders more scale in one network request. One network request, and we're doing 10,000. Um, so it's just one request, 10,000. One request, 10,000. Um, that's, that's a lot more with less. Um, and then we can spend the extra order on safety. So the advantage of double entry as simple, flexible business schema is not only that it can handle any kind of OLTP business transaction, the who, what, when, where, why, and how much, but that it's standardized. So you can pack a double entry transaction in a fixed size struct, put 10,000 of these in a single you know, network request. Um, you've got a UUID for distributed interpotency, debit and credit account ID to describe the who, the amount or the how much. Um, this amount can be any unit of value, not only financial. And then the transaction timestamp obviously is the when. Finally, the transaction metadata, which links back up to your LGP control plan and you've got your user data to record the why, what, and where. So this is really what these systems need to do. They, this is what they all do. You know, so if you have an OLGP database, again, in your control plane, then your data plane can operate on thousands of these 128-byte transactions or two CPU cache lines. So in a single one meg query, you can process 8,000 transactions and with low latency as well. Uh, because if you have a single transaction that you need to do, you just send it right away. You don't batch. Uh, but then as your load increases, your, you know, your requests fill up and you get more and more transactions per query. So this gives not only the best throughput, but counterintuitively, also a sweet spot for latency because your system now has more capacity, more mechanical sympathy. So for example, in your server, uh, with a single receive syscall, um, you can receive 8,000 transactions from a client. And if we then reuse this wire schema for the disk schema, we can write this one meg request as is to the right ahead log plus replicate the same in parallel to a backup machine. So this gives crash consistency, amortizes F-Sync very nicely, and gives you the best performance when you use direct I.O. to do direct memory access to the disk. So direct I.O. is, yes, it's actually faster than buffered I.O. when you do it right. Uh, and it's becoming more and more important also when you think about where network storage memory bandwidth are going. So this graph by Roland Dreyer, I always had this feeling, but I came across it recently. Uh, it shows how network storage and memory bandwidth have increased even just the last three years. But what's interesting is not that everything got faster. Everything did get faster, network storage, memory bandwidth. Everything got faster. But look at that little flip. Um, the relative ratio has completely flipped. So just three years ago, network was the bottleneck, then storage, then memory. So you burned memory bandwidth to make the most of your network and storage bandwidth. You know, you had broom filters. Um, today, everything has inverted. The bottleneck is now memory bandwidth. Uh, so it's like drinking from a fire hose, uh, but through a straw. Uh, so this is an incredible time in the history of database design. I, I haven't figured this out, you know? It's like gravity just inverted. Uh, and this is why we put so much effort into Tiger Beetle, you know, in, into how we work with memory. So fixed size, cache line aligned data structures, Little Indian is everywhere these days, so we no longer wanted to burn memory bandwidth on deserialization on memory copies, and this in turn avoids thrashing the CPU cache. Uh, but most of all, we wanted to invest in static memory allocation. Not the C technique, uh, but the principle of zero memory allocations after startup. So at startup, we allocate everything we know that we need, then at runtime, as you run Tiger Beetle, there's no more malloc or free. 
like no malloc, no free. It, it, it's not, it's verboten, it doesn't happen. Uh, and the mo motivation for this is really the second order effect that this brings. So your memory layout is now handcrafted for efficiency and locality of access. Uh, so there's no waste, no hidden runtime allocation latency, no risk of global allocation panic if you push Tiger Beetle to the limit, and no risk of fragmentation. Uh, and because memory bandwidth is so important for where we felt systems programming was going, if it was a choice between C or Rust and Zig, you know, between the last 30 years of systems programming or investing in the next 30 years, you know, then memory efficiency was really why we decided to invest in Zig. Highly readable, explicit language, great for writing a database uh, where memory bandwidth is more and more the bottleneck. So after appending to the log with a minimum of memory bandwidth, uh, the next step is to execute the transactions, uh, to apply them to our existing state using the architecture of a replicated state machine. Uh, so we take the same inputs, we replay them in the same order uh, through the state machine on every machine uh, to get the same state across the cluster. It's a, such a very simple technique. You've got a distributed log, all your machines process it in the same order, same business logic, same state. Uh, finally, we send a small reply back to the client. This is kind of an interesting trick in Tiger Beetle because we assume success so that we only have to return error codes for the transactions that actually failed. So you save eight kilobytes on the wire. Um, and this is how Tiger Beetle processes 8,000 transactions in a single query, one database query, um, with four syscalls, four mem copies, and three network requests. So do more with less. Uh, however, the biggest win with this network protocol, I mean, these are really massive wins. You know, it could be 30,000 syscalls or something like that. But the biggest win with this network protocol is that it eliminates the need to take 16,000 ROLOX on accounts. You know, for every transaction, there's two accounts. So if we understand that the OLTP workload is business transactions, then we can see why a transactional workload can mean contention. Because if your debit or credit is against a cold account, then the contra account is almost always a hot account. So I'm gonna explain this you know, again. Um, but just bear in mind, you know, in, a, in a general purpose OLGP database like Postgres, SQLite, MySQL, this would force Rolox. Uh, so for example, you have a million customers. You can spread your updates across a million rows. You can horizontally shard, no problem. But all your rights still need to be serialized through your bank account, and you only have one, or you have four. Um, so the effect of Rolox then is, is worse when you go horizontally distributed, because when you shard across machines, um, now transactions have to talk across the network, but they still bottleneck on the bank account, which is on one shard. Um, but you get this effect also in LGP databases you know, as a single node. But this compounds, especially you know, when you consider how compute advances relative to network latency. So there's a law about Moore's law that the number of people predicting the death of Moore's law doubles every two years. <laughs> and I say this because if you look back 10 years ago, you know, if you thought that Moore's law was slowing, and I, I, I think I, I thought so too, you know, um, you know, you can understand why someone might have wanted to scale compute horizontally. You know, however, 10 years later, Moore's Law is still on track. Um, I think this year or next, we're going to get to um, the M3 from Apple with three nanometer process, 100 billion transistors. We're on track. Um, and yeah, a single core has advanced, you know, since 2015, which is after all the cloud databases, after all the horizontal sca you know, scalability strategies. Um, it's a single core is now an order of magnitude more powerful. But all this time, the speed of light in fiber has remained constant. You know, so if you bet on that, if you bet on horizontal for compute, compute is an exponential resource. Um, but if your, if your CPU has to wait on a network request to a shard to complete a transaction, this is gonna appear slower and slower you know, every two years as most law progresses. So you don't want to make the CPU wait on the network. If you do, if you, if you make that decision, it's gonna be twice as costly in two years. Uh, so what Tiger Beetle does then is to keep the hot, contentious transactional data local to every CPU core in the cluster. So we replicate it across all machines. You can, it's more. Um, the principle again is separation of concerns because compute and storage scale differently. Instead of coupling compute and storage, scaling only vertically or only horizontally, you can blend these techniques uh, to scale diagonally. So you go vertical with compute and with the hot storage replicated across the cluster, 
And then you go horizontal to colder remote storage, object storage, you know, tiering, if necessary. But we haven't needed to do this yet with Tiger Beetle. So I'm going to speak to the first two. Um, now that we've looked at the network, how to use it, and when not to, uh, I want to look at Tiger Beetle's storage engine. So when transactions execute through the state machine, um, the results of this execution go into the storage engine. So you, transactions come off the wire, execute the logic into the storage engine, um, into the in-memory component, and then they spill out to disk. But this execution is interesting uh, because as we execute, um, there's no I.O. going on. Uh, again, Moore's law. So the CPU levitates, doesn't touch disk or network. Instead, before execution, we pre-cache all data dependencies um, into memory from disk, so they're ready in memory uh, when execution happens. And then we execute the transaction serially, and it's all debit credit objects, they're all monomorphic, so the instruction cache is hot. And there are zero row locks. Um, so the CPU becomes an Olympic sprinter that you let loose on 100 meters. Uh, from here, the inserts spill out to disk, and for this, you have two main choices, B-tree, LSM tree. Uh, B-tree is optimized for read-heavy workloads at the expense of random writes. LSM tree is optimized for write-heavy workloads at the expense of multiple reads to find an object. But you can always use caching you know, to optimize those reads. Uh, so the original LSM tree paper was published by O'Neill in 1996. Uh, and then a month later, Postgres was born. You know, and so the three most popular OLTP or OLGP databases, they're actually optimized more for read-write OLGP or read-intensive OLAP. They don't actually have the right optimized LSM tree engine, which is what you want for OLTP. So this makes a difference. For example, Meta took um, MySQL, they swapped the engine for RocksDB and LSM tree, and they found that my, my rocks, uh, you know, was 10 times more write efficient. That's their phrase, you know, from, you know, from that blog post, 10 times more write efficient. But even RocksDB is now, you know, more than 10 years old. So, and most of the LSM research is since then, it's recent. So today you can leapfrog. And that's why if the best time to plant an LSM tree was 20 years ago, I think the second best time is now. So I want to show you a few LSM techniques we've developed at Tiger Beetle uh, for predictable performance. When we talk with LSM researchers, for example, at 4th in Crete, uh, they tell us, um, they routinely see, you know, in their words, one to 10 second write stalls in existing LSM trees. So a client is trying to make a request, something goes wrong in the tree, and it's a one to 10 second user visible, you know, your P100. Uh, so the problem is that there's no end-to-end -end control loop between the client requests coming in and the background compaction work that needs to keep up. Uh, so if the engine can't keep up, uh, then it blocks client requests. Um, so there's been a lot of work in RocksDB to improve this, but it's not a guarantee. It's not a solved problem. Uh, and that's because to fix it, compaction really needs to be able to predict how much work the next client request will generate, predict the future. Uh, without limits, you can't, you can't predict the future. So we wanted to eliminate these write stalls. We wanted to have a hard guarantee. But because Tiger Beetle does have limits on all work coming into the system, uh, we could design compaction to be just in time. So compaction does just enough work to be able to absorb the next client request and no more. So it's choreographed. You don't worry, you just need to get the big picture here of, you know, um, something being choreographed. Uh, and I'll tell you what this is. So we divide time into bars, bars into beats, and then each request and the corresponding compaction in terms of CPU, disk, and memory, it's spread out incrementally across these beats. Uh, so we think of this like GC, you know, and this is how you can move from stop the world to paste jitter-free compaction. Um, another technique is how to deal with the problem of using one tree for all your data. Uh, if you store different types and sizes of data in the same LSM tree, then you get this tug of war, uh, you know, how you optimize the engine as described in the RUM, RUM conjecture um, by Athanasoulis, Idrius, Callahan, and others. So the RUM conjecture is that you can optimize for reads and writes, but you pay for it with more memory or space on disk. Pick any two of three formula. Uh, but I think the context for the RUM conjecture is you're storing everything in one tree trying to optimize the tree for all workloads. One tree, and now you try to optimize for all workloads. But what if this is not always the case? Could we then push past the RUM conjecture? What if we broaden the model uh, to assume many trees instead of one, and then we have each tree adapt to its individual workload to have workload awareness? So we go from RUM to RUMBA like this, 
um, can we then find a more efficient Pareto frontier? So we found that if you store different key value sizes in the same tree, then you need to have length prefixes, but writing these length prefixes to disk, it increases you know, um, write and space simplification. You're burning more write bandwidth, using more space. For example, if you have many secondary indexes with values of eight to 32 bytes, um, then a 32-bit length prefix consumes 10 to 30% of write bandwidth and space overhead. Uh, that's 30% is a lot, you know. However, the worst part of putting all your data in one tree is that different key values have different workloads. So half your data, for example, transactions, might be immutable, it's double entry. But if you store these in the same tree as your secondary indexes or your account balances, you know, you're compacting and churning your immutable data again and again and again for no reason. So when you mix your data, it also becomes harder to find because you're looking for a needle in a haystack of wood, brick, and straw. What if we just had a, a wood stack and a brick stack and a, a straw stack, a haystack? Um, so the insight then is not to miss the forest for the trees, but to go from um, an LSM tree to an LSM forest. If you store disjoint data in, di in disjoint trees, you can optimize writes, reads, and memory. You can auto tune according to kind if you have a tree for every type. Uh, so for example, Tiger Beetle's forest is around 20 trees. Um, this reduces read, write, and space amp, improves cache locality as well, because now you have everything tuned according to your access patterns. So this is the second technique in Tiger Beetle's storage engine. Um, the third derives from the fact that more scale demands more durability. So in a study with NetApp, uh, Bairava Syndrome, UW Madison, I found that commodity disks have a half a percent chance of corruption or silent bitrot in a two year window. At scale, this kind of thing becomes common. So probability theory, you go from one disk to 100, start to expect a 50% chance of running into compaction somewhere in your fleet. So UW Madison under Renzi, Andrea Apache Dussault, um, they've done wonderful storage fault research like this over the last 10 years. Um, however, SQLite, you know, which was first released in 2000, before most of this work, does not add any redundancy to the database file for the purpose of detecting corruption or IO errors. SQLite assumes that the data it reads is exactly the same data that it previously wrote. And Postgres and MySQL have a similar crash consistency model. That's what you call it, crash consistency model. So they aim to be consistent in the event of power loss, but they're not actually designed to recover from or even detect storage faults. And you can understand this, uh, you know, because again, much of the research into storage faults was done only after these databases were designed. But this can and does lead to data loss. So 2018, um, this became known as FSyncGet, but users found that Postgres's handling of surprising FSync behavior in the Linux kernel, the way that Postgres handled that could actually accelerate what was an otherwise routine, recoverable, just a storage fault, but it could accelerate that into data loss. So just a temporary sector error, and that could lead to data loss. Um, so Postgres and MySQL were patched for this, uh, to, to panic, rather, and then recover from the log at startup. But then in 2020, UW Madison looked into it, and they found that the fix was not enough. And this is very, this is not well known. Uh, so you know, at startup, when Postgres recovers the log, it actually reads from the kernel page cache in memory. It, it doesn't read what was durably synced to disk. So it doesn't really know what's durable or not when it commits transactions. Um, so the risk of data loss is unfortunately still there. Um, this is gonna be fixed when Postgres finishes adding support for direct IO. And that's, there's a lot of movement there coming into Postgres even this year. Um, so the third storage technique in Tiger Beetle then is to move beyond a crash consistency model and to actually design for an explicit storage fault model to in, uh, assume that, that storage faults do happen. So you can expect latent sector errors, corruption, or even you know, where the firmware or whatever file system will send your reads or writes to the wrong sector or just not even do IO at all. So there are a myriad of detection and recovery techniques that Tiger Beetle uses to solve this model. Um, for example, to checkpoint the log ring buffer every time it wraps, um, we do special read-write quorums. We treat the disk like a distributed system, you know, and we check for quorum overlap. We use write, and then we verify the writes. We read it back in, write-verify techniques. We store checksums out of bands so the parent knows the checksum of the child in case the 
the IO to read the child is misdirected. It's a, a ZFS technique. Um, and then we also have a small, uh, a second small write ahead log. So we have two write ahead logs in Tiger Beetle. The, set, the small one is for metadata to enable Tiger Beetle to determine you know, whether the log is corrupt in the middle of the log because of corruption or if it's torn at the tail because of power loss. So as another example, this is actual Tiger Beetle code. It's a comment in the source. It shows how we enumerate all these kinds of, sort of faults under the model um, to see how they influence our recovery at startup. Um, and because it's a matrix, the recovery actions can be generated dynamically, tested to be sure that, that you know, every case is handled. So as you start to accept you know, that disk sectors do fail, you also start to see another problem with existing engines. And that's because the data file they produce is not deterministic, um, what they produce on disk. You know, if a single disk sector fails on one machine, the data files on other machines are all different. So you have to recover the whole data file from, from another machine. And this can take hours or days, you know, gigabytes, terabytes. So to solve this, Tiger Beetle's just-in-time compaction um, is also deterministic, so that the same log always produces the exact same data file across every machine in the cluster. Um, so the storage engine is deterministic, what it produces on disk, um, which is very unique. You know? but So now, if you see that a 64 kilobyte block is corrupt, that's all you need to transfer over the network. Um, so at this point, I'm sure you're wondering, okay, you're on, why not RAID? Uh, why not just put Postgres on RAID uh, or SQLite on RAID? And of course, the answer is that if you're already replicating your data across three machines, you know, for a three times storage overhead, then extra local RAID redundancy triples this. Now you 9x storage overhead. But you also don't need to because you have global you know, redundancy that you can tap into. So it's more efficient to take your storage engine and integrate it with your consensus protocol. Um, then you can recover from local faults using your global redundancy. You share and you can also share one log between the storage engine and consensus. In a lot of systems, there's actually two logs. So you, you're halving your write bandwidth. Um, if you can share the log, you double your write efficiency. So these are all techniques in Tiger Beetle's storage engine to solve write stalls, push the limits of performance past RUM, increase durability, optimize recovery. And these are all integrated with the con consensus protocol. So we've already looked at how we optimize the network um, to process 8,000 transactions in one query. We use the same technique to make consensus just as cheap. Uh, so instead of replicating transactions one by one through the consensus log, a single entry in the consensus log replicates 8,000 transactions. One consensus commit, 8,000. It's the same idea. It's very powerful. Um, and this is only one, again, one round trip to a backup to replicate, optimal, because you need data on more than one machine for durability anyway. So where consensus comes in is when you want to use this redundancy not only for durability, but also for high availability, for automated failover when your primary machine fails. So it's not enough to have synchronous replication. You also want automated failover. And we do this using um, the pioneering replication and consensus protocol, view stamp replication by Brian Oki, Barbara Liskov, James Cowling. Uh, so it was actually published a year before Paxos and revised again two years before Raft. Raft is almost exactly the same protocol as VSR. Names are changed. But it missed out on optimizations that Liskov and Cowling introduced in their 2012 VSR paper. So if you haven't read it yet, I think this is the most intuitive of the consensus papers, also more optimal, which I'm gonna, we're going to go into now. So for example, in Raft, you don't know ahead of time who the next primary will be. If the primary current leader crashes, who's the next leader? You don't know. Um, whereas in VSR, you do have a pretty good idea. Um, because the election of the new primary in VSR is actually round robin. Uh, each machine has what is called a view number. Um, they bump this number when a quorum of the cluster confirms that the old primary is down, and then a simple modulo tells you who the new primary is. That's consensus, like I've just explained it to you. Thanks, thanks to Brian Oki, Bob Liskov, James Cowling. So simple, but even more powerful because you've got more information encoded in the protocol. So there's also no protocol in Raft, actually, to repair the log of what otherwise might be a perfect candidate. So Raft can sometimes get stuck. For example, you have three machines. Replica zero on the left is primary, and then you've got two backups. So leader and two followers. But the classical terminology is always primary and backup, which is what we use. So replica zero is the primary, has three entries in the log. 
um, replica one has three, replica two only has two. It hasn't got the latest um, log entry. And then replica two crashes. So Raft here would have to elect replica one as primary. And this makes sense because replica one has a longer log than replica two, it has more data. However, what if replica one has a sector fault in the first entry of its log? So in this scenario, your Raft cluster is actually stuck. It has to wait until replica zero recovers. Um, whereas VSR is able to elect either replica one or replica two and then transfer you know, the missing log entries across. So in other words, by limiting who can be primary, Raft doesn't fully utilize the global redundancy that you're paying for as it could. And at scale, this matters. You know? um, so Raft's formal proof also assumes stable storage, but that the stable storage disk is perfect. So there's no idea of storage faults. Um, whereas VSR can run only in memory. So it's a very nice protocol for prototyping if, if you're afraid of working with the disk. Um, VSR can also run with stable storage, like Raft, which is what we do with Tiger Beetle, except the storage engine that we have can detect disk faults and cooperate with VSR to recover. So one of the ways we do this is by extending the consensus log with a cryptographic hash chain of the checksums of our ops that are going through consensus. So this means we can go beyond Raft to handle situations even where all machines have a corrupt log, uh, but in different places. So here we've got ops one, two, and three corrupt across different machines. Raft, you would, the cluster is lost. There's no way to recover in terms of the Raft protocol. Uh, what we do is we've got a checksum from C back to B, and then from B back to A's checksum. So Tiger Beetle can actually stitch this log back together and keep going. Um, the hash chain also means that the primary doesn't need to have an op on its own disk before it commits. Usually, you know, you append to your disk, replicate, then you commit, but you've got to wait for your disk. What if the disk is slow? This technique, you don't have to wait for your disk. Um, you can just go as fast as the fastest two of three disks in your cluster. Um, and then backups can also receive ops out of order. They don't have to try and first catch up. They can take the op from the primary, say, yes, I got this, and then they'll catch up in the background. Whereas in Raft, normally, they have to block the primary and say, wait, wait, I've got a gap, let me go and repair first, and then I'll tell you it's okay, keeps the client waiting. So this technique can also optimize backups that they give you know, very fast acts to the primary. Um, so far, I've only shown you cases where Raft can get stuck, uh, and that's only because it wasn't designed for storage faults. Um, that's fine, it doesn't have a storage fault model. Um, but again, new research since Raft was designed protocol-aware recovery for consensus-based storage. So if you're writing a consensus protocol, how do you do storage? This is really the paper you want to look at. Um, Alligapan, Ganesan, UW Madison, won best paper FAST 2018. Again, it's so, so recent, you know, so we just didn't know this when, when Raft was designed. Uh, but this shows how with Raft and Paxos, a single sector fault on one machine can actually just ruin your whole cluster and cause global, you know, cluster data loss. Um, it can propagate through the protocol. For example, if the first op on replica one is corrupt, we've seen this example, um, uh, then its checksum isn't gonna validate. And what typically happens at startup, replica one will see, oh, this checksum didn't validate. I must have been writing this, and then the power went off. Again, the crash consistency model. And then replica one will truncate its log all the way back to zero. So you lose, you lose all those committed transactions. Uh, and that's really because it's conflating the checksum error with the torn right after crash. But, but actually that was just corruption on disk, which is a half percent chance you know, every two years. Um, so this will erase committed operations and you get split brain and, and everything is messed up. So in Tiger Beetle, we implement protocol aware recovery and we ask the cluster to figure out, well, what is the correct action to take to recover from the storage fault? Um, so I wanna show you one more trick um, that we're working on still. I everything I've shown you here you know, is in. Um, we're fine tuning our compaction pacing, but everything is in. But I wanna show you one more trick. Um, and this is the insight with consensus, right? Normally, you wanna replicate an op across your cluster, you wait for a quorum, then you execute. So you always replicate, get quorum, execute. But the insight is that 99% of the time, your ops are always going to get the quorum. It's only if like the primary is down or some machines are down that you don't get the quorum. So 99% of the time, why not just execute? Let's, let's append to our disk, let's replicate, and let's execute through the state machine in parallel. 
um, we can remove that write barrier. Um, then we just wait. We've executed, we cache that result, and when we do get the quorum, then we apply it. So basically, you're getting a head start on your state machine execution. Um, and then you only throw the execution away if the op actually doesn't receive quorum. So you get like a, a round trip time of head start. But this is really powerful because this is basically saying consensus is now 100% free. Like, there, you know, whether you're doing single node or cluster, it doesn't matter because that round trip, we're, we're using it to execute CPU. So Moore's law, this, you know, today it's 15% win. Two years' time, it's a 30% win. Four years' time, you know, eight years' time, it, then your, your CPU is even free. Um, so our, you know, it's been three years since the start of Tiger Beetle, production release around the corner. Um, with the design decisions I've showed you, uh, Tiger Beetle is able to do today 988,000 transactions per second. We're going for a million. We should get there. We've got some more techniques to come. Um, and that's on NVMe with primary indexes, everything you need to do data, uh, change data capture, um, a million a second. Um, if we then index all columns in Tiger Beetle, you know, so we can do very predictable multi-attribute queries with zigzag merge join, which is fantastic. I actually think Postgres and MySQL don't have zigzag merge join. So it's something, something that's newer again, but it's a great way to do multi-attribute queries, um, also in the works. But if we add 20 secondary indexes, so we add a lot of indexes now, um, then Tiger Beetle is still able to do 200 to 500,000 transactions per second, business transactions. Uh, and that's again, 20 secondary indexes for nice multi-attribute scans. And the P99 is under 100 milliseconds. Um, more important than performance is safety. Um, how can we hope to be safer than things that were, you know, 30 years tried and tested? I have to be a guru to get this right. And I know a guru or two, we're certainly not. So instead we adopted NASA's power of 10 rules for safety critical code. Uh, it's not a standard you see very often, um, but it means that there's 4,000 assertions in Tiger Beetle as it runs, it's checking itself. Uh, there are limits also on all the resources, memory like I've showed you, but even concurrency, even our, our while loops, we put a safety counter on. So everything is worked out. We know how much resource any algorithm will use in terms of memory especially. Um, so you get a piece of software that has, it's like rock solid. It's, it's got a well-defined shape. You can depend on the shape. It's not gonna change. And all these limits are known statically at compile time. Zig's got amazing compile time obviously. Um, but finally, we designed Tiger Beetle not only as a distributed database, but as a deterministic distributed database. So this means then you can take this whole database cluster, you can run it in a simulated world that's deterministic. You can simulate different latencies of network storage, different bandwidths. You can inject all kinds of faults, very high levels of storage faults. We, we do that. Um, and then you can verify correctness and liveness of the consensus protocol of the storage engine up to the theoretical limit. So you can say, look, I'm gonna correct, corrupt every log on every replica in different places. Can you stitch that log together? Can you keep going? Or do you shut down prematurely? Um, and because this testing is also uh, completely deterministic, you can replay bugs from a single seed. Um, and then you get this incredible rapid debug velocity. Um, but the most valuable thing with simulation testing, and obviously this is inspired by Foundation DB, who've really pioneered this, our heroes. Um, the most valuable thing with this is that you can actually speed up time. Time itself is simulated, so you just speed it up in a while true loop. Tick that second hand while true, um, you know, in the simulated world. So, for example, if you run the Tiger Beetle simulator on your, in your terminal, just for 3.3 seconds, you've got the equivalent of 39 minutes of, of you know, real test time on average. You run for two days, you get two years of test time. And we run 10 of these simulators 24 seven, just burning CPU um, uh, to put years on the clock. You know? And this is actually verifying the consensus, the actual code, the actual implementation is verified like this. And it's all virtual. So you're running you know, a whole cluster of real Tiger Beetle code um, in your terminal, all the IO, the time is all simulated. But what if, you know, this also means this is a whole simulated world. What if we can transplant this world? What if, you know, we could, if we wanted to, you know, you could do something fun, like, you know, you could compile this to WASM and you could run this whole simulation in your browser also. Or, um, and of course, this is what we went and did. 
Um, so I want to. This is what I want to leave with you now. Um, you're welcome to go go to this yourself later. Sim.tigerbeetle.com, and um, I was walking on Golden Gate yesterday, and I thought, well, we've got this simulated world. What if we can take this cluster of tiger beetles running real tiger beetle code, and just like teleport them onto Golden Gate Bridge? Uh, so we, of course, the, this is what we went and did as a team. Um, let's see if we get some sound. So now we're going to see no faults at all, no processes crash, rep, you know, networks perfect, storage perfect, go Golden Gate Bridge. Traffic has stopped. Tiger beetles descend. You can see who the Captain America is, the leader. And the client requests at the top, they're sending the, the requests in. Cluster started. This is all real Tiger Beetle code. The beetles don't even know that they're at QCon on Golden Gate Bridge. This is like real Tiger Beetle code, all VSR consensus. And you can see the replication happening and the acts and the replies going back to clients. All the faults on the left, everything is perfect. And I think we should stop there, because this is a live demo. Law of demos, let's, let's just leave it at that. Oh, we're out of time. <laughs> OK. Uh, shall we stop? Anyone want to go further? Next level? OK. So this is now Red Desert. Andy Pavlo's in the bath doing his bath lecture. That was famous. Uh, here we've got network faults, so we're going to mess with the network drop network packets on the ground, partition the beetles in that Mission Impossible 5 glass box. Um, and you can see the cluster is now starting to do ele le you know, leader elections. The primary is, you also if you look at the primary, you can see it's going round robin, because it's VSR round robin. So it's moving clockwise around the circle. If you, and you can see the one that holds the helmet when it's orange is the next primary. Uh, and if you want, uh, let me see. We added a few fun tools here. So let's find the primary, which will be this one. It's, this is quite a hard game to play, OK. Because they changed, they automatically fell over so fast. Uh, let's, OK, there's our primary. Okay, wait. We will, we will succeed. Uh, there we go, OK. And you can crash it and then watch, watch it recover. Um, let's move on because this is radioactive. So how does your database do if you just corrupt the disk? You know, 8% of reads, you corrupt them. You, every machine is writing to disk and you're corrupting 9% of the time. Let's just do that because it's a simulation. See what happens. Um, and we found so many bugs in our code like this. Um, so now we're actually exercising the whole storage fault model. And we zap the tiger beetles with cosmic rays. And let's see what happens. And the simulator is testing, you know, strict serializability, just like Jepson would, but it does it in real time, not after the fact. Uh, and you can see we've got different latencies simulated, different packet loss, um, different read and write corruption, eight, nine percent, um, and everything is working. Otherwise, the simulator would crash. Uh, uh, so let's do now. If you're a fan of DuckDB, there's a little Easter egg if you click that duck. Uh, you can engage duck mode and see if OLTP can survive OLAP, which is not easy to do, but Tiger Beetle can do it. Uh, we put this in there just for our, our friends there at DuckDB. Um, but you can also do a bit of lightning, uh, just very violent. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Tiger Beetle survives. And this is just thanks to Foundation DB. What you can do, you know, if you simulate everything deterministically, put all your faults in. Um, and that's that, folks. Uh, again, it's so nice to be with you here today. And um, yeah, looking forward to, to that production release of Tiger Beetle.